On a February evening in 2001, in Edinburgh, Scotland, a small turboprop airliner crashes just minutes after takeoff from Edinburgh Airport. Once climbing to just over a couple of thousand feet in the air, the plane suffers a dual engine failure. Attempting to glide to safety, the pilots judged that it would be necessary to ditch the plane in the water. Both pilots were killed in the resulting crash landing in the water. How did both engines fail on Logan Air Flight 670 Alpha? And what conditions did the plane endure before takeoff? In the late evening of February 26, 2001, a small cargo plane operated by the Scottish airline Logan Air is making an approach into Edinburgh Airport, the capital city of Scotland. It is close to midnight, and a new crew is expected to take the plane on another flight in less than an hour's time. At just after midnight going into February 27th, this Logan Air plane lands and is taxied over to the cargo apron. The plane is a Short Brothers SD360, a British-built regional turboprop airliner. The plane had a 10-year production run between 1981 and 1989, with a total of 165 of these planes produced. Many of these planes became part of regional fleets in the United Kingdom. It is a very boxy looking plane that was very common in the skies over the UK from the 1980s to the 2000s. Scottish regional airline Logan Air operates many regional routes all across Scotland, many of which link some of the harder to reach areas of the country with the large cities of Edinburgh and Glasgow. In 1993, Logan Air signed a franchise agreement with British Airways, and as such, Logan Air planes were painted in the colour scheme of British Airways. The short 360 plane registered as Golf Bravo November Mike Tango was one of these planes that had been painted in a British Airways livery. This particular plane was given a rather colourful tail fin. It was standard at British Airways around the turn of the millennium that BA and subsequent franchise planes would have their tail fins painted in one of many different designs that were inspired from artists all around the world. Golf Bravo November Mike Tango was converted into a freighter and was used on mail flights for the then state-owned Royal Mail. Upon arrival into Edinburgh at just after midnight, the plane was expected to depart again at 12.40am on a single leg flight to Belfast, Northern Ireland with a different crew. Weather had been abysmal for days now in Scotland. Easterly winds had brought freezing temperatures and snow. According to a news article published the very day of the accident flight, trains into Scotland were cancelled, roads had become impassable, and even up to 100,000 homes in Scotland were left without power. As is standard procedure in these treacherous winter conditions, de-icing is needed prior to departure to ensure that no snow accumulates on the wings. De-icing equipment at Edinburgh, however, was not available at the time that the crew needed in the early morning and would not be available for several hours. The plane was going nowhere, and the crew that was supposed to take the plane out then returned to the crew room in the terminal. It was now 10 past 2 in the morning. Edinburgh Airport was now closed due to severe weather. The Royal Mail cargo flight to Belfast was now postponed until further notice. By 6am, the crew were notified that the airport would still likely not be open for several hours. To secure the plane, a crew member then fitted propeller straps to the plane's two engines, as well as fitting the pitot covers. One piece of equipment that was absent and was not available were the covers for the engine air intakes, often referred to as intake bungs. According to the official accident report, these bungs were only located at the operator's main operating hubs in Glasgow, Inverness and Kirkwall, and were not readily available for this plane at Edinburgh. The operations manual issued by the aircraft's manufacturer and approved by the British Civil Aviation Authority states that in the event that the plane must be unattended for a prolonged period of time, the aircraft is to be secured in such a manner that it is protected from adverse weather conditions. And should the aircraft be left for any length of time, then engine blanks or bungs must be fitted alongside the pitot covers and chocks. The Logan Air short 360 mail plane was parked on the cargo apron located on the northeast side of Edinburgh Airport at what was at the time numbered as Stand 31. The wind was also blowing almost directly on the plane's reciprocal heading on this stand with no major obstructions. This allowed snow and ice to be blown into the plane's unprotected engine air intakes, where the correct equipment should have been fitted to stop this exact thing from occurring. There had been known incidents from pilots of the Shaw 360 and other similar aircraft including the Dash 8 series of planes, warning of double loss of power from the engines on a takeoff run in winter conditions. This information, however, was not widely known in the industry at the time. 
The plane had also not been de-iced by the time that the crew that should have flown the plane had went off duty later that morning. All day, the plane would sit there on the apron until a new crew arrives to fly to Belfast as Logan Air Flight 670 Alpha. The accident crew were actually based at Glasgow, not Edinburgh, and had been scheduled to make a totally different flight to Isla in the Scottish Hebrides at around 9am that day. Again, because of the brutal winter conditions, that flight was cancelled. This crew was then rescheduled to take the delayed Logan Air mail flight from Edinburgh to Belfast. The two crew members consisted of 58-year-old Captain Carl Mason. With a total flying experience exceeding 13,500 hours, he started his flying career in the Royal Air Force. He even spent some time flying helicopters in the North Sea. However, he does have less than 1,000 hours on the short 360. His first officer was the much younger 29-year-old Russell Dixon. He has a total flying experience of only 438 hours, with just 72 logged on this plane. Both crew members must be relocated to Edinburgh, however ground travel on this day was impossible due to the weather. No trains were running between the two cities, and road connections did not fare much better. As such, Logan Air flew them out as passengers on another plane to get them to the airport. Edinburgh Airport reopened at 11.30am, where the crew arrived thereafter. According to the accident report, there was no record of the crew's activity at the airport once they arrived. It is likely, however, that the crew would have performed a walk-around to inspect the outside of the plane for any abnormalities. It was not until after 3pm that the plane had made any progress, when clearance to start the engines was requested from the control tower. By this time, the plane had been parked on the stand for over 14 hours pointing directly into the wind. 9-10 to 10 of those hours saw significant snowfall at the airport. Snow had been blowing into the engine intakes all day. There was, however, another delay, as at 3.12pm, the engines were shut down again because of a technical problem. This technical problem was with the plane's right-hand generator. It would not start and provide power to the plane. A plane gets its electrical power from the generators which are powered by the engines. If the generators do not work, even though the engines may be running, the plane will not have electrical power. Accounts from those on the ground had shown that the plane had stopped and started the engines multiple times during the 10 or so minutes between when they had requested startup and when they had to delay the flight further. The flight was delayed again as the accident crew returned to the terminal to seek help from their company. Logan Air had then sent out an engineer stationed at Edinburgh to help troubleshoot the problems with the plane. The engineer had fixed the problem after resetting the connections inside the engine generator control protection units. Afterwards, the crew were advised as part of this procedure, the plane's engines must run on the ground for around 15 to 20 minutes. Despite these problems with the engine, the investigation later determined that this played no part in the accident. At the engineer's request, the pilots performed another engine startup and the problem seemed to have been fixed. The issue did not resurface. The engines were once again shut down as the captain had also then requested the engineer to check the engine oil and that the top surfaces of the wing were free of any significant snow or ice buildup. The top of the wing cannot be viewed from the ground or the cockpit as the wing is fixed above the fuselage. Once inspecting the wings, the engineer reports that the only contamination on the plane was a small accumulation of ice on the windscreen, which was quickly cleared. An inspection of the engine air intakes was not performed. Both engines were eventually restarted, and the plane stayed at the gate for 20 minutes with the engines running. It was now 5.10pm, when First Officer Dixon requested taxi clearance. The plane taxied out to runway 06 at Edinburgh for their flight to Belfast. Once the engines were running, heat inside of them would have caused some of the snow which had accumulated to melt, which, according to the accident report, created a mixture of unknown proportions. As part of their checks before takeoff, the crew ran through a checklist for the first flight of the day. This included an auto feather test, which on this plane automatically starts up the plane's anti-icing system. The operations manual calls for all ice protection on board to be switched on in visible moisture if the temperature outside is below 6 degrees Celsius. The anti-ice system on the Shaw 360 works so that anti-ice vanes redirect airflow so that it filters out snow and ice. On this occasion, snow had built up inside the engine throughout and thus cannot simply be ejected with this anti-ice system. After takeoff, the crew must also lower and retract the landing gear multiple times to clear any snow and ice in the landing gear. The takeoff from Edinburgh was normal. After takeoff, the landing gear was recycled as the crew discussed as part of their checklists. At 1200 feet, 
the pilots reduced the power on the engines as normal. Afterward, Captain Mason called for the after takeoff checklist to be started. Once the item for the stall heaters was called out, the captain asked for the anti ice system to be switched on, likely knowing that there could be icing conditions ahead as they are expected to fly through some cloud. Air traffic control hands the plane off as intended. All seems to be routine until at 2,200 feet, around 4 seconds after the first officer switches on the anti ice, the torque readings on both engines quickly fall away to zero. The captain immediately identified the problem with the first officer as a dual engine failure. The reason for these engine failures was determined by the investigation to be a result of a blockage or a disturbance of airflow inside the engine intakes, caused by the movement of the accumulation of snow, ice or slush inside the engine. When the anti-ice system was turned on, the anti-ice vanes inside the engines moved. When they moved, the icy contents inside had also shifted and it caused a blockage or disturbance in the airflow which the engine requires in order to run. As a result, both engines failed. First Officer Dixon then broadcasts a mayday message on frequency, while Captain Mason takes control and begins to bank the plane to the right. By this point, the plane had now been passing over the Firth of Forth estuary near Edinburgh Airport. To achieve an optimal glide path, Captain Mason slows the plane to 110 knots and glides the plane at a rate of descent of 2,800 feet per minute. It becomes clear that the plane will run out of altitude in less than a minute. The estuary is large and wide. It also became apparent that the crew will need to ditch the plane in the water. There was a transmission issue between the plane and the ground as the first officer tried to make a further call to the tower with their intentions, although this message was not received. The captain begins preparations for ditching by using what speed there is left to raise the nose of the plane to gently ease it into the water. With a speed of just 86 knots, the plane hits the water with a nose up angle of 6.8 degrees. The forces of the water drag the plane down where it came to a rest just 65 meters from the shoreline. This area of the estuary is shallow with only around 6 meters in water depth. And as such, the front end of the plane was submerged. This resulting crash landing killed both members of the flight crew as the plane was destroyed in the accident. The investigation recommended that the Civil Aviation Authority in the United Kingdom advises all operators of the Short 360 of the potential of engine failure resulting from the accumulation of snow and ice in the engine intakes where the plane has been parked for a prolonged period of time unprotected, going on further to state that the activation of the anti-ice vanes can therefore disrupt the level of airflow in the engine intakes. The Civil Aviation Authority would go on to publish a document which called for all UK airlines to review their operations manuals and update accordingly to the findings and recommendations made by the investigation and the CAA. Logan Air continues to operate today as a critical regional airline in the United Kingdom as a whole. As for the Short 360 airplane, it is a type which has long since been retired for commercial use in the United Kingdom. Some of these planes, however, can still be found in areas all across the world. Hello everyone, thank you so much for making it to the end of this video, I do hope you enjoyed it. This will be the first of two videos this week, the next will be on Saturday evening. It is that time of the week again where I thank my patrons over on Patreon. If you'd like to have your name featured or read out at the end of the next video, you can join my Patreon from £3 per month. A thank you to my £5 patrons, Aidan Montgomery, Hector Palmatellas, Jacopo, Katy P123, Ken Zachman, Christy, Marie Innes, Pac-Man 7, and Wrong Track 58. Special thanks to my £10 patrons for their ever so generous support. Cherub Cherub, Daniel Hendricks, D. Rogers, Side Effect, Will Tanner. Thank you guys so much, I really appreciate your support. And that's it for me today. I hope you have a good day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.